Welcome to this episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show and the communications director for Crucible Leadership. And you have clicked play on, uh, hopefully you've clicked subscribe to, a podcast that discusses, deals with what we call at Crucible Leadership, crucible experiences. Uh, Those are those moments in life, those things that we all know too well, when uh, times are tough traumas, tragedies, failures, setbacks, um, some sort of uh, disruption happens in our lives and it requires us to move beyond it, to uh, continue to live our lives um, in the way that we wish to live our lives. They change the trajectory of our lives, do crucible experiences. And the good news um, about why we talk about them here on Crucible Leadership is not to just share war stories and swap them back and forth, but to really unpack um, the lessons of those crucibles so that we can apply them to the very thing that I just addressed earlier, which is moving forward and moving beyond those crucible experiences. And um, as always with me in this endeavor is the founder of Crucible Leadership and the host of the podcast, and that would be Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, um, good conversation today, I uh, believe. Yes, Gary. Uh, looking forward to it. This one, listeners, today's conversation, uh, the, the big umbrella title that we've come up with is um, charting your own course. Uh, and, and it's done specifically. Um, the, the themes around it are in the wake of crucibles that are holiday timed. Um, And those crucibles are the kinds of things, you know, we all sing it's Christmas is coming up. Uh, New Year's is going to follow after that. And we all, you know, the crucibles that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about how to overcome those and chart your own course through those um, things that we sing about this time of year, right? Uh, But it isn't always tidings of comfort and joy that we're experiencing at this time as much as we want to. Sometimes we're struggling with sadness and broken relationships. We're not always singing old Lang Syne. Sometimes we're dealing with old wounds. And uh, that's really what we want to unpack here because uh, we know that um, we're not the only ones going through this as we often, as we always hope, um, uh, we're offering hope and healing and insight to folks like you who are listening. So Warwick, I know this particular topic has been one that you've been doing lots of thinking about over the last, uh, just before we started uh, recording here, you said over the last week or more, you've been thinking about this. Yeah, I have, Gary. I mean, it's interesting, the holidays and, you know, in the U.S., there's a few of them, uh, you know, Thanksgiving, uh, Hanukkah, Christmas, New Year's, straight, of course, we don't have Thanksgiving, but um, yeah, the holidays can be a joyous time with family. In the with coronavirus, uh, for many of us, our family gatherings are not as big as they normally are. Which obviously there's a sense of loss there with grandparents and cousins and extended family, and they can be a joyous time. But they, it can also be a, a time of loss, or maybe there's conflict, maybe broken relationships with family, maybe friends. So it's. Often uh, during the holidays, there are mixed emotions, conflicting emotions. And it's often a time where a time of reflection, a time of contemplation. And um, yeah, I guess uh, for me, um, that was the case. And kind of what triggered this, uh, and I'm a reflective person by nature, you know, full disclosure. Our <laughs> listeners, I think by now our listeners are well aware of that work. Uh, and, and I mean that in the best possible way. That, and, you know, that, like with any quality we have, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. I mean, there's always a positive and a negative side for any of our traits. And so uh, I am reflective. And so really what triggered this time of reflection for me um, I was just going through some old photographs. And by old, I mean like, really old. Uh, As listeners will know, um, when I was born, my dad was in his late 50s. So he was actually born in 1901. Yes, that's 1901. 
Wow. I mean, like 120 years ago or something, whatever <laughs> the math is. It's a long time ago. Obviously, he's uh, passed away a long time ago. Both my parents have now passed. And so I was looking at this photograph that I think it was probably when he was about 20, 21. It was somewhere around 1922. And, uh, you know, YouTube, you can see it. Maybe we'll put it in the show notes. So see if I can kind of hold it there. Yep. So for, uh, for people that can see this on uh, YouTube, uh, my dad is sort of the young guy in the jacket, is the youngest guy there. His mom is to the right of him. She's pretty tall. Um, and uh, so obviously this is pretty old. People are wearing those early 20s kind of clothes. Right. And um, it's funny, this came in this... Uh, it's kind of wild, this, this Kodak film wallet. See if I can hold this up here uh, for people. And oh, wow. this is Kodak. It says, this is from Oxford where my dad was. Uh, on the back, it says, um, you know, Kodak film is, is the, uh, you know, is the best film for, um, uh, what does it say on the front for... Uh, uh, for, for Kodaks and brownies. You know, brownies was a very old-fashioned form of camera. So this is like... Back in the days before your phone was your camera. Yeah, this is like <laughs> way, way back. Before right, then. right. So, okay, it's just a photograph. So it's kind of like, so what? And so... But that kind of, photograph, right? That yeah. photograph triggered some reflective emotions in you. It, it did because, uh, you know, here's this guy who... You know, I mean, hold it up again. You know, a pretty good-looking guy. You know, seemed to be relaxed, at ease. Um, obviously, you know, came from a well-off family. My family has had <coughs> significant wealth for uh, generations. But, um, yeah, so anyway, I guess uh, the point is, as I looked at that, it triggered a bunch of emotions. I remember thinking, okay, he doesn't know what is to come, but he was to be married three times um, while the family seemed pretty happy back then. There were rifts within the family, which is a variety of reasons between my cousin or a cousin of my dad and my dad's eldest son, um, who was by his first marriage. And anytime there's divorce, it absolutely affects the kids. I was fortunate because I was from the last marriage of my dad and my mother, who was married before she married my dad. So I didn't grow up with you know, a, a child of divorced parents. I was fortunate. But it takes, it takes an effect. And so I looked at that, and it was almost sort of wistful. It's like, well, I knew obviously who my dad was and my grandmother, but I have no idea who these other people are. It's too long ago. There's, you know, people, there's nobody alive who would have a clue who these people are. So right. part of it was this wistful sense of um, for generations uh, in my family, uh, certainly, as the, as the listeners know, the founder of the family uh, family business, John Fairfax, was a person of great faith. So it seemed like there were good marriages, you know, no divorce, as far as I know, happy marriages. It was just really close knit family. And then, you know, this is like about 1922 or something. Over the decades, somehow, maybe it was more power, more money, more marriages. Somehow the family, there were rifts within the family, um, children, divorced parents, that has an effect. Um, you know, there was a tendency back then, if you were wealthy, to raise your kids with nannies. That would be true in Australia, in the US, in the UK, in, in that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of looked at that. I was almost partly wistful, partly it's like, you know, all my, I mean, my dad was a good man in a lot of ways, but it's like, gosh, dad, you know, did you have to get married three times? Couldn't you have been a bit more thoughtful and the devastation and family and just both my parents have gone, the house where I grew up in Fairwater, which is a pretty amazing house, that's gone. So it was, it was a sense of loss of um, what's no longer here and a sense of sadness, a little bit of anger at my, my dad for maybe some decisions that could have been better and rifts in the family. Not all of them were his fault, but, there were some things he did that probably weren't helpful. And so there was a, a mixed emotions of wistfulness, sadness. Gee, why couldn't things have been like they were um, 
pride in my father's generation, really a complex set of emotions that kind of almost saddened me, depressed me a little bit. So it was a, yeah. that one photo set off a flood of emotions and thoughts, as, as photos often do. Yeah. And it's not, you know, it, it's interesting. You described some things about your family. Uh, your great-great-grandfather uh, started this media business, and uh, he was a man of faith. And um, I know uh, what you know, uh, not as intimately as you know it, but I know what you know from reading his biography written by another member of the family, that you know, his, his relationship with his wife was very strong. And we say often on the show when we're talking to guests, that um, it's amazing how crucible experiences, even though the circumstances of what you're going through may be different, uh, the emotions are the same. And I think what perhaps in, in neon lights, what I see here is no, not many of our listeners have grown up like you grew up with a, with a family that had that kind of legacy of, um, of influence and money and power and all of the things that come with it. But um, uh, that legacy of broken relationships and divorce and decisions made that have ramifications down through the generations, um, that, is a, uh, that is a fairly common, unfortunately, thing um, in many families. And I think it comes to uh, a sharp focus for us at this time of year. This is, I, I, as I said um, uh, in, in the beginning, this is the time of year that we're singing about tidings of comfort and joy, but we're not always feeling comfortable no. and joyous. <clears throat> no, sometimes it's memories of, of sadness. Sometimes it's happy memories that could also cause us to be sad, which sounds strange, but they're times that we've lost, like, you know, with my parents, um, who, you know, they had their foibles like we all do, but they dearly loved each other and just memories of um, growing up at Fairwater on the Sydney Harbour and uh, Christmas Eve, we would gather around the uh, piano and sing Christmas carols and it would always be amusing because none of us could really play the piano and uh, my dad would attempt to play and I think he probably learned how to play the piano in school 50, 60 years before, but hadn't played much ever since, except at Christmas right. Eve, once a year. He'd right. play with two hands, and you know, we'd start off playing Hark the Herald Angels, and it would be like, Hark, hang on, hang on. <laughs> the, okay, almost got it. Herald, he tried to do two hands, and it's like, and then he would, you know, remove the left hand because it's far easier to play the play piano with just one hand and so you'd play the piano with one hand and we'd sing a few christmas carols but every single year it'd be the same ritual it's like it'd be like dad give it up you know you don't play the piano that well right just go straight to one hand well, why do the two-hand ritual but in some strange way it was this uh, this nice um memory or Every family has its own traditions. Uh, you know, we'd have a lot of extended family would come over and we had a huge dining room table, you know, the mahogany kind of deal. But we wouldn't open our presents until after lunch. Not only after lunch, after the adults had coffee. Mm. And because in the English Australian tradition, you eat lunch at one, it could be two, two thirty oh, or boy. later. It's yeah. like, and by that point, my cousins and I, there's a lot of kids. It's like, seriously, can you hurry up with the, with the, you know, the food and the coffee. I mean, let's get on with it. But so, you know, you've got some happy, amusing memories. But, you know, when I think about this sense of reflection about the holidays, yes, you've got the sad and the happy memories in the past, which are gone and mixed emotions. But then not only do you have the past, you have the present. Uh, right. It's almost like, uh, you know, Christmas carol, you know, the ghost of Christmas past, present and future, all that kind of thing. Well, there's the right. present. And sometimes that's great. Right now, as I've mentioned, uh, we've discussed with COVID, there aren't too many people that are having a normal uh, Christmas or holiday gathering uh, this year. And sometimes there can be a sense of joy. Other times it can be broken relationships with siblings or cousins, or maybe we have um, relatives that have made choices in life that we think aren't as helpful for them, but you know, we don't say anything or if we have it doesn't go down well and we try and love and accept, but we feel right. 
sad, sorry, frustrated, depending on the relationship, it could be even be, you know, angry. Here we go again. You know, they're going to push my buttons for the 53rd time. And, right. you know, I'm going to try and smile and pretend it didn't affect me. And, um, yeah. And, and you've sometimes got work, things. and sometimes it can be, and, and I'm going to do, uh, here's a picture I'm going to hold up. I posted this on Facebook today. Um, this is my family, my, me and my, um, uh, my two brothers and two sisters. Uh, at a, and you can see I'm the little guy in the, uh, clearly wearing, I'm the little guy getting held up over there on the, <laughs> on the far side by my big brother. That's but, awesome. Um, uh, and we'll show this uh, in, the, in the show notes too, so people can see what I'm talking about. But there you see, a, you know, all kids, um, we were all kids around the Christmas tree. We were all younger than, you know, probably, uh, well, let's see, if my brother's 14 years ago all younger than 18 than 18 most in in just early double digits me and very early single digits and you know half of the people in that photograph or half of my siblings have passed away i um i have and in addition to my mother um i have eulogized uh half of my family my uh, my mother my older sister my older brother um and my stepfather um and holidays can also bring about the longing for situations like I just showed, right? There's a lot of people who, who go through that. People who you've celebrated with before not only aren't there because of COVID, but because of life's, you know, they, they, they've, they've left this life. They've departed this life. And that kind of sadness can ring as well at this time and you can think back on those moments and you can get reflective well, you, about right i mean those situations that, that photo and you go why couldn't life be like that now why couldn't i have my siblings at christmas my mom my stepdad i mean you know that was a, a a nice memory why does that have to go you know can't right. we have that again somehow it, it right. inevitably for most people, it triggers those sea of emotions of, you know, um, yeah. So it's, it's a time of, of reflection, um, time of frustration. And I guess the challenge with all this is, you know, it's fine to be wistful and maybe remember some of those things, but don't let either the happy emotions or the sad ones pull you down. I said, but how can happy emotions pull you down? Well, because it can be a sense of like that photograph that you showed a sense of loss. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it doesn't, it sounds simple to say this, but if it doesn't serve you, I mean, remember it, but don't, as one of our guests, uh, Professor Badaroko, Joe Badaroko said, ruminate versus reflect. If, if it's ruminating as in, gosh, that's unfair. And well, how did that have to happen? And it's natural, but you don't want to dwell on there and just live in it and let those emotions flood. It doesn't mean, you know, you're not dishonoring folks by not letting it pull you down. So, it, you know, treasure those memories. Uh, try to um, not let the negative ones pull you down. And, you know, part of the whole chart, your own course is each of us has our own memories our own path our own new beginning if you will right so, and and the idea of of calling this episode chart your own course it's it's very similar again even though circumstances are different from the crucibles that we have on or the crucible situations that we talk about mostly on the show or usually on the show in that you need to quote unquote learn the lessons of your crucible you need to learn the lessons of that wistfulness of those those setbacks, those tragedies, those traumas, those things that we've been discussing that have happened to you. You need to learn those lessons. And then it comes, the idea of charting your own course is how do you move beyond that? It's the same thing that we say about any crucible. You need to learn the lessons. It doesn't happen overnight in most cases. But once you learn those lessons, then how do you to go back to um, a very uh, impactful statement you made in, in a podcast a few episodes back, how do you take one small step at a time, one small step followed by another small step by another small step to begin to chart your course beyond 
the crucible of those uh, those holiday woes, depressions, sadness, broken relationships, conflicts. How do you do that? And that's what we really want to spend most of our time talking about here. Yeah, I mean, you said a very interesting thing, which was learn the lessons of your crucible and indeed the crucibles you grew up in, maybe right. you know, other family members' crucibles, because we can learn from our family things that we admire. And you know, I admired my dad's integrity and um, uh, you know, doing what he felt was right. But we can also learn from our family's mistakes. Doesn't right. mean we dishonor them by saying that, but you know, we're going to make our own mistakes, but at least maybe we can hopefully avoid some ones that other family members have made. So as I mentioned, my dad was married three times. And when I was growing up, I was pretty paranoid about that because I saw mm -hmm. the, the um, devastations, maybe too strong a word, or maybe it's not, but the impact it caused on my older half siblings. And I didn't want that to be me. I didn't want that to be my kids. So I was very, very paranoid. You know, I wanted, because I'm a person of faith, I wanted to uh, marry a woman uh, of faith and character. Character was the single most important thing to me. Um, and by, you know, from my perspective, the grace of God, um, you know, I met a woman of character and faith um, <clears throat> who, you know, wasn't really, you know, didn't care about money or that kind of thing, which, you know, when I met her, it was in the middle of the whole takeover thing. She was American, just uh, visiting Australia at the time. Um, and we'd been married a little over uh, 30 years. And mm. that, is, is, as I maybe mentioned before, is such a blessing. And I you know, loved her very much when we were married, and I love her more now. And I loved right. her a lot back then. So that, so, you know, I don't take that for granted. Like with any relationship, you've got to be humble and help each other, serve each other and all of that. But um, at least that's a different course than my father had. My, my, my kids have not grown up in a broken home. Right. So that's, that's a big difference. And part of what is undoubtedly helping you right now go f work your way through what you described as the frustration, the wistfulness, even the anger a little bit mm -hmm. that you felt when you saw that photograph of your dad and you, and you thought about some of the decisions he made in life. Part of, a, a huge part of what's helping you through that is, is focusing on changing your perspective, getting your gaze off of what went before that you couldn't control, and then putting your gaze on those things that are, that are before you that you're living in right now that are blessings. And I want to share with listeners because I think it, this, um, this fits with that. And that's, um, this isn't the holiday that we're in now. It's past. It was Thanksgiving. But Abraham Lincoln was the, the president who established a national day of Thanksgiving. And it's not widely known. Um, it's not talked about every year at Thanksgiving. But he issued his proclamation for Thanksgiving on October 3rd, 1863. That was just two weeks after more than 34,000 Americans were killed or wounded in the battle of, I'm gonna pronounce it wrong, Chickamauga uh, in the Civil War. And this is what he wrote in his proclamation. So as you think about those things behind you, those things that, are go that have gone bad, those things that feel hard, Think of what Lincoln's saying here and then what he says in the end. But this is what he wrote. The year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and beautiful skies. So he's already looking ahead. He's seen things that aren't that terrible devastation of war. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed that we're prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, which are of so extraordinary a nature they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart, which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, peace has been preserved with all nations, order has been maintained, the laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict. Needful diversions of wealth 
and of strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The ax has enlarged the borders of our settlements and the country rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. This is how he ends it. It has seemed to me fit and proper that these gifts should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole of the American people. Take that, that to me is, is just incredible that at that point in the Civil War, one of the bloodiest days, two weeks after one of the bloodiest days in the Civil War, he could see those blessings, those positive things. And I think about that when you say, despite what you've been going through, as you've looked back and you've, and you've felt remorse and regret over some things that were, that were, that were in your past caused by your forebears, you look at your wife and your family and you see those blessings. You see those things that give you riotous Thanksgiving. Well, that's so well said. I mean, just for Lincoln to be thankful amidst the horrors of the Civil War, which at the time was the most um, horrific war, you know, hundreds of thousands, I mean, enormous a number of soldiers died. Uh, I think it wasn't, you know, World War One. sadly was worse, but at the time, in the history of humankind, more people died during that war than any other war right. in history. Uh, it was just staggering. So to be thankful amidst that is, is, it's just hard to even fathom. But yeah, I mean, I think. And that was, let me say this, let me just add yeah, this one thing. Sure. That was something from an editorial. I used to be editorial page editor of a newspaper in Palm Springs, California. And I wrote an editorial about this in, on Thanksgiving in 1999. But here's how I ended that, just to, yeah. to bridge to the point yeah, you're yeah. about to make. Yeah. I said, if Lincoln could find such abundant reason to be thankful in the thick of war, how difficult can it really be for us? Take a few minutes today, I urged readers, after the pumpkin pie and before the football game, it was Thanksgiving, to look around your life, even if it seems more battlefield than bountiful right now, you too can permit yourself to expect a continuance of whatever blessings you find there. Yeah, I mean, that's so well said. I mean, not many of us are going through the kind of crucible that you know, as as divided as the country is now, that's a whole nother level of uh, division that the country was uh, going through in the Civil War. So, yeah, I mean, we can, despite our circumstances, we can always be grateful. And kind of as I was mentioning earlier, you know, I tried to learn from, you know, frankly, some of the mistakes of my forebears. And, uh, you know, my dad, because of the way he was raised, I think certainly my older two siblings, from my father's first marriage, you know, they were raised by nannies to a degree, even this is like the 1930s. My dad and his first wife went to England for like a year and they had small kids who were like, I don't know, six, three, somewhere around there. It's just unbelievable. You would sort of leave small kids alone for so long, but people did that back then, wealthy families. Um, so for us, you know, um, you know, maybe we'd have a babysitter once in a while, but um, we wanted uh, to raise our kids ourselves, which sounds pretty normal, but it's for wealthy people, which I didn't, you know, I uh, wasn't at the same level as, as my parents when my kids were small. Um, I just wanted to be around them. I didn't want to be this workaholic dad that was, you know, never around. And, right. you know, I was there at their soccer games or, dance recitals or whatever. And as I think I've mentioned before, w you know, we do cards, at, you know, uh, fa uh, family birthdays, or, you know, we say what we most admire about people. I'm going to steal that idea, by the way. <laughs> I've loved that ever since you brought it up the first time. Well, and what's amazing is my boys who are more athletic, they got Gail's jeans and uh, my daughter got my jeans, which is not quite as athletic. They all say, well, thanks, Dad. You were there at my soccer game, my tennis game, my dance recital. So we've charted our own course. And it doesn't mean we haven't made mistakes. But, you know, um, 
just my kids didn't grow up in a broken home. We were present parents. We were there. You know, we've tried to encourage them. We try not to tell them what to do. So, yeah, I'm sure we've made our own course, but uh, made our own mistakes, but we've charted our, our own course. And so I'm grateful for a loving wife, for loving kids. My kids are all in their 20s because of COVID. They're all with us right now. Yeah. So that is amazing. And, you know, we all get on. And, um, yeah, that's what I mean to say. There's not the odd speed bump here and there. But um, I have a lot to be... I have a lot to be thankful for. You know, we have a beautiful home. Uh, my wife has an interior design background. And so, you know, she's a fantastic cook, <laughs> which doesn't, you don't have to be not always a good cook if you're an interior designer, but she's a, a great cook, but she also knows how to make the house look so wonderful. Her right. grandfather was uh, born in Norway. So you've got some Norwegian Viking little figures around the place and, you know, we've got our own traditions and um, yeah, I've got so, I've, um, so much to be thankful for, so much blessing. So I think when you start feeling melancholy and maybe not everybody is as blessed as frankly, uh, you know, I am or, or we are, but um, focus on well, what are you grateful for? You know, what are the things that you feel blessed? And I think, you know, don't focus on the negative, especially the negative you can't control. You know, whether it's bro- yeah, if you, it, it, broken relationships, maybe there are some things you can do, but it's not, it's not, it's not always, you can't always solve everything yourself. So, you know, don't, don't get overly melancholy about loss, even if it's the happy memories, the sad memories. Think about the things you're grateful for, the things that you have now that are such a blessing and, and reflect on maybe rather than focusing on the negative, I could focus on the negative decisions, you know, the $2.25 billion takeover and 150 year old family business going out of the family and the mistakes I made, which caused some rift in the family. I could focus on all of that, um, but focus on maybe some of the positive things. You know, it sounds a bit too much of ego, but it's okay maybe to be thankful for maybe some of the good decisions you've made as a person of faith. Mm-hmm it's a lot easier for me because I can say, thank you, God, because I, I view it as his wisdom and his guidance that have helped me make hopefully a few good decisions. So I, don't, I really more turn the thanks back to him rather than to me. So gratitude is a huge way of kind of uh, dealing with what can be the crucible experience of the melancholy slash wistful feelings of the holidays. Yeah. And you, in addition to the personal um, uh, blessings that you've talked about. I mean, you've, you've shared on this show uh, many times, um, professionally speaking things, right? There are those who, who, who will look at you still and say, my goodness, you could have run a, bil- you know, a, a multi-billion dollar media empire. It could still be going and you could be, you know, Bill Gates and you could be all that stuff. And professionally, you could have all this influence, um, but you've carved out a professional niche that uh, you're quite blessed by, I know. Yeah, I mean, part of charting your own course, obviously, I've talked a bit about family and, you know, how my wife and I want to approach that. And fortunately, 80, 90, 95% of the time on any major decision, we're in agreement, which is an unbelievable blessing, I've got to say. Um, but in professionally, um, yeah, I mean, I could be all kind of, oh my gosh, I could have been this powerful media mogul and, you know, I mean, we're very, very comfortable, but I could have been more than very, very comfortable and had, you know, multi millions or billions or something. And, you know, I don't know what, you know, the way the uber wealthy are, you know, house, house in the South of France, another one in Aspen and, you know, dotted around the place, maybe the Maldives, I don't know, you know, pick your favorite spot and, and some do, and, and that's fine. Uh, but yeah, I'm not as well known. Um, you know, uh, I don't have the accolades, my um, forebears, I think I've mentioned an earlier podcast, my dad was a knight, had the same name as I have. So he was so Warwick and, you know, his dad was Sir James and then Sir James Redding. I don't have a knighthood, you know, but Okay, so I could look at the things I don't have, the big family business, the 
respect and accolades. My Wikipedia entry is not particularly favorable. It's young, hot-headed, good kid, could have had it all, doesn't have it. So I could focus on that. But really what I should be focusing on, which I like to think I do most of the time, is you know, I've moved on from that, from a um, variety of experiences I've mentioned through uh, working in an aviation services company and financial analysis and business analysis to being executive coach, uh, to being uh, an elder at my non-denominational church and on the, have been in the past been on the board of my kid's school to now with Crucible Leadership. You know, I have a book on Crucible Leadership that will come out next year. We have, you know, this podcast, Beyond the Crucible, um, active on social media, uh, have a, a blog. And, you know, I'm also blessed to have an unbelievable team. Obviously, you know, you and I, I'm blessed to have, you know, you on the team, uh, the folks at, at, uh, at Signal, um, Carrie for the you know book sales, uh, Steve on the um, podcast side. I mean, I've I'm so blessed. I've charted my own course. I love what I do, helping people think of how crucibles, as you so aptly say at the end of every podcast, how crucibles don't have to be the end of your story. They can be the beginning of an exciting new chapter. I mean, I'm really, really blessed. Not not only personally, but professionally and I have charted my own course. I love what I do. I say really that's another key is, um, you know, hopefully you have charted your own course if you haven't, or maybe now would be a good time to reflect, not just on hopefully the happy memories in the past, but reflect on, well, okay, maybe I've made mistakes. Maybe I've, I've made choices that weren't too good. I've certainly spoken a lot about the choices I've made, certainly professionally that weren't so good and that impacted wider family members. But now's a time when maybe you can think of um, what do I want my life personally and professionally to be like? You know, we, we can't control a lot of things in life. We can't control the COVID pandemic. I mean, we can be safe and sane and all that. And uh, when the vaccine comes out, that'll help. But what we can control is our choices. Every day we get to make a choice, many choices. Our lives are a whole sum of choices. Our lives, are a whole, our legacy is a sum of choices and decisions. We can't change our past choices and our past decisions, but we can change the ones today and tomorrow. So think about what course do I want to chart? How is it in line with my values and, and what I believe in, and what I think is important? Today, that's something that we should focus on. Focus on what you can change today and focus on the future. What do you want your life to be like? What course do you want to chart? That is, it's almost like you knew I had this book here and I was going to say this and you didn't. You didn't know. We haven't talked about this. You were just talking about focus on the future. This is a, a quote from, the, uh, from Bono, the lead singer of U2 and um, the, you know, a, a rock star who probably has uh, a home in the south of France and all that stuff. <laughs> But, but, but here's what Bono said about the future. <clears throat> I used to think the future was solid or fixed, something you inherited like an old building that you move into when the previous generation moves out or gets chased out. But it's not. The future is not fixed. It's fluid. You can build your own building or hut or condo. The world is more malleable. I love that phrase. The world is more malleable than you think. And it's waiting for you to hammer it into shape. I mean, that is such a great quote. And it's right. I mean, we cannot change the past. Even some things about the present, we can't necessarily change. Certainly we can't change other people's decisions and choices in life. But the future, it's... You know, there are a lot about that that we can change. We can change the decisions we want to make, how we treat people around us, both personally and professionally. We can, we can choose to move in a direction that, as we say in Crystal Leadership, that is in line with our internal wiring, is in line with our gifting, in line with our values, is something that we're off the charts passionate about, is a vision that we think will make the world a better place, be it in a small way or maybe even a bigger way. The future is something that we um, maybe I can't control, but we can certainly 
control our choices, our decisions. So really, in the vein of what you mentioned earlier about one's step is over the holiday period, I guess the question we want to ask ourselves is, especially for those that maybe aren't following a course, aren't charting a course that they really are excited about, that they believe is meaningful, what one decision are you going to make this holiday period, this Christmas season, this New Year's season, that will move in a positive direction? I'm not a huge believer in New Year's resolutions because you make them and then you forget them. But, you know, maybe a, a life resolution or, a, you know, what, what's one small step that will take you in a direction that's positive? You know, part of, part of moving from the melancholy to is, you know, forgiving past family members. Like, you know, I don't have a lot of angst towards my dad. I deeply respected him, but maybe forgiving him for being young and, you know, maybe not making as good a choice as perhaps he could have. Uh, but part of it too is forgiving yourself. I really try and work on this. Um, as uh, a reminder, Tommy Breedlove talks a lot about, uh, who we've had on the podcast, he talks a lot about self-leadership. Well, part of self-leadership is you've got to forgive yourself. So I have to forgive my uh, poor choices in, professionally in the family business um, and, you know, whatever other poor choices I've made because you can't control it. Learn from it, as I've mentioned. Absolutely learn from it. Try not to repeat the same mistake over and over again because history does tend to repeat itself. Uh, but forgive yourself, forgive those around you, and, and move forward. You know, there's a scripture that talks about, uh, I think it's in Philippians, you know, forgetting what is behind and moving toward what is ahead. Um, that obviously has a faith uh, connotation, but whatever your perspective, focus on where do you want to move on ahead? What do you want your life to be like personally and professionally? Think of that, value the good. Let go of the bad memories, forgive yourself, forgive others, and move forward, chart your own course. So that's really probably the key to getting out of the negative wistfulness and melancholy is be grateful for what you have and chart your own course as you move forward. Focus on be grateful for the present, the bits that you should be grateful for, but focus on the future. That's your eye should be, should be ahead. Your eye should not be on the path that you've walked previously, uh, or at least only as lessons learned, but not, you know, ruminating forever. So don't focus on the past. Don't even focus so much on the present. You know, be cognizant of it, but have your eyes faced forward, looking to the hills, looking to the mountains, hopefully the rainbows. Just look forward. That's where your focus should be. That is an excellent point uh, to begin what I often say on the show as uh, the captain's turned on the fasten seatbelt signs and it's getting time to land the plane. But because we've talked about Christmas and this is going to air during the Christmas uh, season, uh, I'm going to say that uh, Santa has indicated to the, uh, the reindeer <laughs> that it's, uh, it's about time to land the sleigh. Um, <clears throat> before we do that, uh, one thing I want to say uh, to you and to listeners about you is um, you've said many times on the show, Warwick, you've said many times that your Wikipedia entry, uh, and you've always referenced it as it says something along the lines of brash, impetuous young yeah. kid could have had it all. Right. Uh, I would argue uh, that that uh, brash, impetuous young kid has grown into uh, a man who does indeed have it all of the things that matter. Well, it's, I don't, if by saying well said, it make, makes it seem like it's arrogant, but <laughs> I can't think of anything else to say other than, yeah, I mean, the wife, the family, um, you know, we have the flexibility, you know, financially to, you know, uh, not be held back a whole lot, I have to say. Um, professionally, I love what I do. I have a great team. Um, I go to a great church. I mean, I am, uh, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. I mean, I, yeah, logically, I don't have a whole lot of reason to uh, be melancholy, but we're human. But um, yeah, no, I feel blessed. And I think, you know, maybe others don't have as much reason. I don't know. But I think we can all, they're, they're all, most of us can think of things that we are blessed by. 
and things Absolutely. that we're thankful for. You know, you looked at that photograph of your family. I'm sure you look back at, you know, your mom and relatives and you think, okay, everything wasn't all roses and peaches and cream, but, you know, there were things to be thankful for. You know, Absolutely. obviously you're thankful for your current uh, life and, you know. Yeah. And the guy, wife, and you, you, I mean, you, you, your life hasn't been perfect, but you've got a lot no. to be thankful for too, right? Absolutely. My, my big brother, who's 14 years older than me, who was holding me in that photo, um, he lives now. I'm back in my hometown. He's my best friend. We've grown closer together over the years. I mean, he was holding me just because he was the only one who wouldn't drop me in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're actually, you know, we're, 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 closer than brothers we're, we're as close as brothers and great friends so that is that is entirely true as we wrap up as the as the sleigh touches down um connect for listeners the dots warwick to from the beginning when you talked about the picture of your dad and and the wistfulness that that sort of brought to you and the and the sadness in some senses and and the and this idea of charting your own course uh bring those two points together um uh, as we as we um, put the reindeer on the ground. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, I mean, I think I can look at that photo and be angry, wistful. It's like, well, you know, uh, short of uh, heaven, where I'm sure that's where John Fairfax is, I'm not going to meet him on this earth. I'm not going to meet these relatives from three or four generations ago. And that's okay. Let it go, you know? Let go of the fact that my dad made some decisions, not all of which were good. Well, I've made some decisions, not all of which were good. Just let it go. Be grateful for the blessings that you have, um, but just let it go. Just kind of open your arms, open your hands, and just, just, just kind of let it go. It's like, whew, let it go. Breathe it out. It's okay. You know, don't, don't, obsess, don't obsess over it. Um, be grateful. So let go of even the good and bad memories. If they're pulling you down, that which pulls you down, you need to let go of. Even the good, which sounds a bit um, a contradiction in terms. Be grateful for what you have, family, professionally. And then, as we say in chart your own course, think of the future. You know, uh, what do you want your legacy to be on your deathbed? We talk a lot about life significance for a reason. You know, what do you want your life of significance, a life on purpose dedicated to serving others? How is charting your own course fueling a life of significance that when you're on your deathbed and when others are eulogizing you, what are they going to be saying in that eulogy? What do you want them to say? You know, you can influence that today. So focus on the future, focus on a life of significance, focus on a life that you and others around you will be proud of. That's really you know, that should be uh, the future. And, you know, as you chart your own course to a life significance, that's really uh, where you should devote a bit more energy to than over-reflecting about the past when it doesn't serve you and pulls you down. And with that, I can see that Rudolph has dimmed his red nose, <laughs> the sleigh's on the ground, Santa's scrambling out to deliver presents. And, and you, 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 need to, you need to give a shout out, speaking of Rudolph, to the, to the blog you just wrote, because <clears throat> it would be great if listeners could read that, because you, know, you, you can't mention Rudolph without mentioning the blog. Yes, the, uh, there's a blog at crucibleleadership.com. Thank you for the plug, Warwick. At crucibleleadership.com, if you click on blog, you'll see a, a, a holiday-themed blog which extracts pivotal crucible leadership learnings from the story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and that beloved special that we've all seen dating back to its premiere in 1964. So um, uh, hopefully you enjoy that. Hopefully, listener, you've enjoyed this episode of Beyond the Crucible. Uh, thank you, as always, for spending your time with us um, uh, you can learn more about not just the blog, but about Crucible Leadership. Uh, we have some very interesting um, things going on there. Visit crucibleleadership.com. Poke around a little bit. You'll find some resources, including an assessment you can take to see where you are on your journey to move beyond your crucible. Um, you can find out uh, your profile. Are you a um, an Imagineer? Right? What's where are you at on the on the on the road 
And then what is your personality profile as you're traveling that road? So check that out at crucibleleadership.com. Um, and until we're together the next time, uh, do remember the, the essence of what we've talked about here. And I'm not going to do what I do often um, and say, here's three takeaways. Because I think the key takeaway of this episode is uh, goes back to Warwick, um, what he said a couple podcasts ago, and he repeated here. And that is, what's the one small step you can take as you want to move beyond this crucible of some of the tensions and, 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 and trials and things that can be associated with the holiday season? Take that step. Um, find your blessings. Take that step. And uh, as Bono says, get out your hammer and start, uh, and, and start shaping your future. Um, because w- our crucible experiences, as we've talked about here, and as we talk about every week, are not the end of your story. If you learn the lessons of them, if you apply the lessons of them, if you recognize the blessings amid them, uh, it's far from the end of your story. It's in fact the beginning of a new story, which can be the most rewarding story of your life, which can be the story that leads your um, your uh, virtual Wikipedia entry, if you don't have a real Wikipedia entry, to say that you are indeed someone who uh, who has it all. And that is because when you learn the lessons of your crucible and you apply them and you move beyond your crucible, you find your way to a life of significance.